Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we'll be looking at the story of Judah and Tamar in Genesis chapter 38 in our continuing study of the book of Genesis. Back in Genesis chapter 19, we had the Abraham narrative, and all of a sudden there was a break in that where we, the camera went down to Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom in particular, and looked at Lot, and we had the Lot story, and then it shifted back to Abraham, and we had the rest of the Abraham story. Likewise, we just started the story of Joseph. He's sold as a slave into Egypt in Genesis chapter 37, uh, and we turned the page expecting to, to read about Joseph in Egypt, but instead, the camera switches back and takes us to Judah, and there's this story of Judah and Tamar in Genesis chapter 38. When that's done, we're going to pick up and continue with the Joseph narrative in Genesis chapter 39 and following. But, but this is an interlude. Now, the interlude starts with Judah, who takes a Canaanite wife uh, by the name of Shua, and they have children. They're going to be children of Judah and Shua. And we'll have, only the boys are mentioned, Er and Onan and Shelah. And just as Judah has taken a Canaanite wife, he goes out to get Canaanite wives, although he only gets as far as one, a Canaanite wife for his sons. And now we are introduced to Tamar. Um, Tamar and Er. And so what's happening is Judah and his family are beginning to to intermarry with the Canaanites. Remember, that had been the plan that had been proposed by Shechem and the people of the town of Shechem. Um, well, Judah's actually following in that plan. But as things would turn out, Er commits evil in the eyes of the Lord, and he dies. Now, that leaves Tamar without any children, without any connection to the, to the family of Judah, and so what was appropriate in that day and age, the, the cultural norm, and it's, it was even law in certain places, where if a, uh, if a man died and his wife did, had no children, then in order to provide children for her, which would be eventually her retirement plan, her social security, to have children who would, who would care for her in her old age, what was required was that the the, the brother, the next in line, he was required to come and, and provide children for her to, to have a union with her so that now children who would be the legal heirs as if they had been the sons of her husband. And so Onan does this. And we read in Genesis 38, verse 9, Onan knew that the offspring would not be his, so when he went into his brother's wife, he wasted his seed on the ground in order not to give offspring to his brother. So they have a union, but not one, and it's deliberate, not one that produces a child. And as a result, Onan dies as well. Now, meanwhile, Judah is looking at this. You know, he's had two of his sons die, and he's got a son left who's, who's a bit younger, but, but he's beginning to wonder, maybe, uh, you know, Tamar, does she have some black widow tendencies? What's happening here? And so we read, Then Judah said to his daughter-in-law, Tamar, Remain a widow in your father's house. He, he, you know, she goes home to daddy. Until my son Shelah grows up, for he thought, I'm afraid that he too may die <laughs> like his brothers. It, you know, he, this is an excuse. And so Tamar is sent home, and she went and lived in her father's house. <coughs> Meanwhile, Shua dies. And so now there's, there's no more connection with the Canaanites. There's Tamar, who, who was supposed to be connected, but she's been sent home to daddy. And there's Judah, who had a Canaanite wife, but, but now she's passed away. <coughs> it was told to Tamar, behold, and that time has passed. It was told to Tamar, behold, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. So she removed her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in the gateway of Enaim, which is on the road to Timnah, for she saw that Shelah had grown up. This time has passed. He's, he's an adult now. 
and she had not been given to him as a wife because Judah, you know, sort of out of sight, out of mind, and, and didn't really want to have anything to do with Tamar. So when she, she goes and she sets up shop, and she dresses like a prostitute, and when Judah saw her, he comes along the way, uh, along the path, and when Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot, for she had covered her face. So he doesn't recognize her, can't recognize her. All he sees is the eyes, but she's, she's dressed up in, in presumably sort of a revealing way, but hiding her face. So he turned aside to her by the road and said, Here now, let me come in to you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, What will you give me that you may come in to me? He said, Therefore, I will send you a young goat from the flock. <laughs> you know, he said, I don't have my wallet with me. Uh, and, and she said, moreover, will you give a pledge until you send it? You know, she's asking for some sort of recompense. She's asking, you know, can you leave your, your driver's license and your credit card? And, and he gives the ancient equivalent. He said, what pledge uh, shall I give you? And she said, your seal and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. These were identifying marks. So, she, so he gave them to her and went into her and she conceived by him. He's just looking for a quick deliance. But she's looking for a child who will be the legal heir. Now, now it was about three months later that Judah was informed, your daughter-in-law Tamar has played the harlot. She's pregnant and she's not married. <laughs> and behold, she's also with child by harlotry. And so Judah, in his self-righteousness, Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. You know, he, he, she's, uh, she's acted unfaithfully, so let her be put to death, and, and he's going to be rid of her. And Tamar comes out and says, well, you're right, I, I am guilty, but by the way, let me tell you who the, the father is. I am with child by the man to whom these things belong, and she, she presents them, basically... <laughs> his driver's license and his credit card. You know, these identifying marks that show that Judah is the father. Now, notice the deceptions that have taken place in this extended family. We had Jacob who was deceived by Isaac. Jacob had donned the clothing of Esau, had used the skin of a goat in the deception. And we had read that Isaac had not recognized Jacob. Uh, and, and the Hebrew word, uh, nekar, had been used there. We had read just recently about how the ten sons had deceived Jacob uh, in bringing the, the coat of many colors, or the coat with sleeves, the coat of Joseph. The sons of Jacob had deceived him with that coat that was stained with the blood of a goat. Notice the, term, the reference to a goat again. And there again, Jacob in Genesis chapter 37, verse 32, had asked to examine and to recognize, to not care the coat. And here again, we have Tamar deceiving Judah, and Tamar takes the pledge of Judah's seal and cord and is promised a goat. So in all three deceptive stories, there's a goat somewhere in the story. And we read that Judah recognizes the items of his pledge, and that exactly the same term is used for his recognition. We're supposed to link the stories together. Now, what are we to think then of Tamar herself? This is not activity that we're saying, we're tell we don't tell our Sunday school girls, you know, go and act like Tamar. No, in fact, we usually in Sunday school, we, we just sort of pass over the story. But Judah recognizes his items, and he says, she's more righteous than I, inasmuch as I did not give her to my son, Shelah. She wanted what God had. And in that, Judah recognizes something positive. So that Tamar is the account of a Canaanite who had come into the covenant community and who had learned to value the heritage of the seed of Abraham, just as Jacob wanted what God had, Tamar wants what God has, and will go to any length in order to get it. It's noteworthy that 
Tamar, and she's not the only one, and if we look at the genealogy of Jesus, here she dresses and acts like a prostitute, really acts the part. If we look at the other woman in Matthew chapter 1, that genealogy of Jesus, we see Rahab, who is a prostitute. We see Ruth, a, a Moabite woman who actually comes to by night to uh, Boaz and, and, and looks like she's about to act like a prostitute. She, she doesn't. Um, and we have Bathsheba, an adulterous woman. And finally, um, we have Mary, who shouldered an assumption in the way she acted she bears a child out of wedlock. Now, there was nothing inappropriate, but it looked that way to the outside world. And all of these women are in that genealogy, beginning, beginning with Tamar. Now, I said that um, there's an excursus earlier in that Lot story, and here we have the Judah narrative. Back in the Lot story, remember Lot was the relative of the main character. He was the nephew. Judah's a relative of the main character of the story that's been interrupted. He's the brother of Joseph. In the Lot narrative, it was a seduction story. This is a seduction story as well. In the Lot narrative, the sisters seduce their father and have children by them. Here, it's the woman who seduces her father-in-law. In the Lot story, the sisters trick the man because they're afraid that he's not going to go along with it. He probably wouldn't have. Uh, here in the Judah narrative, she tricks, Tamar tricks Judah because she's afraid he will not go along with it. In the Lot narrative, they're concerned about continuing their husband's legacy. And here in the Judah narrative, Tamar is concerned about continuing her husband's legacy. In the Lot story, at the end of the story, two children are born, Moab and Ammon. Here in the Judah story, even though they, you know, they just come together on a, on a single, at a single time, two children, two twins, are going to be born. It came about, at the time she was giving birth, that behold, there were twins in her womb. Moreover, it took place while she was giving birth, one put out a hand... And the midwife took and tied a scarlet thread on his hand, saying, This one came out first. But it came about as he drew back his hand that, behold, his brother came out. Now, how do you count that? <laughs> and, and then she said, What a breach you have made for yourself. So he was named breach, or the way you say that in Hebrew, perez, or, or uh, thrusting out, as it were. Uh, afterward, his brother came out, who had the scarlet thread on his hand, and he was named Zera. Now, again, this is part of that younger brother motif where we had Seth chosen instead of Cain, we had Isaac instead of Ishmael, we had Jacob instead of Esau, and now we have Perez instead of Zera, who comes forth. We're going to, we're not there yet, at, toward the end of the Genesis story, we're going to have Ephraim instead of Manasseh. And it's a reminder that we have an elder brother who has given us his inheritance. And indeed, he, we didn't have to take it from him. He freely gave it to us. He died purposefully so that we could be co-heirs with him.